All right, we'll get started. Uh, welcome to the 215th meeting of the New York Linux Users Group, the latest in our regular monthly meetups. Tonight we have Andrea Arcangeli and John Masters. Did I butcher that? Am I good? That's okay. Uh, who will be giving us a talk called Speculation Out of Control, Taming CPU Features. Hard quotes there. Um, I'd like to say how much we appreciate our sponsor, Two Sigma, for letting us return to this lovely space. And thank you to everyone here for taking the opportunity to join us tonight. Uh, tonight, before we get started, uh, we have our usual requests. Please silence your cell phones. Uh, do not eat snacks in noisy wrappers during the presentation. Uh, and please use the mics for questions so you can be heard in the recording so the folks uh, can hear the question and the answer. Um, also, we are looking for questions, not statements, questions. Uh, I'd like to repeat our thanks for a regular space sponsor, Two Sigma, and acknowledge all of our other sponsors, past and present, Bloomberg, IBM, Canonical, Brandor Group, Google, and Pearson for their support. In addition, Nylug would not be able to function without our many volunteers who have contributed greatly over the years. Uh, announcements. Um, for workshops, Simo, can you raise your hand real quick? Uh, we'll be posting links to, uh, or sorry, dates for the next workshops. Uh, and if you have any questions, uh, talk to Simo back there. Uh, currently, or recently, they've been happening at the NYU Silver Building, Room 500, 32 Waverly Place. Uh, the next general meetup will be on May 15th at Facebook, uh, and will feature Leonard Pottering, Pottering, pardon. Uh, our friend from the System D project, who will be talking about the current status of System D. Uh, please stay tuned. Uh, we'll be listing that on Meetup soon. Uh, after the presentation, we'll be heading to the Cupping Room Cafe, 359 West Broadway, two blocks east of here. Uh, please hold off on any questions to the end. Uh, we'll be activating again this mic, uh, for fo and we'll ask folks to line up for questions. Okay, on to the talk. Andrea Arcangeli joined Kumranet. Mm -hmm. Yes. <laughs> uh, and then Red Hat in 2008 uh, because of his interest in working on the KVM virtualization hypervisor. Uh, with a special interest in virtual memory management, uh, he worked on many parts of the Linux, Linux kernel, especially on the virtual memory sub subsystem. Uh, Andrea started working on Linux in his spare time shortly after first connecting to the internet back in 1996 while studying at university. Long time ago. <laughs> he enjoys spending most of his time solving software problems and promoting the adoption of Linux and open source software everywhere. John Masters is a computer architect specializing in high performance microarchitecture at Red Hat, where he is chief ARM architect and works on Cache Coherent Shared Virtual Memory Workload Acceleration. I had to sort of, thank you. Uh, and among other topics. He also co-created the technical mitigation, mitigation team for cache side channel attacks like Meltdown, uh, Spectre, etc. Cool t-shirt. Um, I'm jealous. Now please welcome Andre and John giving us speculation out of control, taming CPU features. Hi everyone, I'm very glad to be here and uh, the talk will be in two parts. First, John will talk about uh, the hardware side of things and how the attack works. And I will explain uh, the mitigations, how the mitigations are implemented upstream and downstream. John? Thank you. Thank you. Is this on? It is on. Okay. <laughs> All right, and I'll hand off to Andrea in a little while. Let's see if this works. Okay. See if the clicker is working. Okay. So put your hand up here if you have never seen these logos before in your life. Okay, good. All right. That's a good joke. Uh, <laughs> um, we've become very familiar with these. Uh, you can buy t-shirts. Uh, you can get the exploit code for Meltdown on the back. Um, if you're really cool, my girlfriend's in the audience, if you're really cool, then uh, you get a cape for fighting vulnerabilities. So she got me this for Valentine's Day. Now, how cool is that? <laughs> right? Isn't that awesome? So 
You wish you were that cool. Anyway, uh, so we'll talk a little bit about uh, the way that computer architecture has evolved over the past few decades and how we got to uh, the point we're at now um, with these particular vulnerabilities. And then, as Andrea said, he will walk through um, the consequences and how they were mitigated uh, in Linux and then in, in general purpose software as well. And then we'll take questions at the end. So I'm going to give you guys a little bit of a refresher on a bunch of hardware topics. Uh, you may or may not know these, but I'm going to go pretty quickly uh, on the grounds that these slides will be online, uh, and you'll be able to read through them later in more detail. So uh, let's talk about computer architecture first. So architecture defines um, a contract between hardware and software. Right? So we've all heard of different computer architectures, or I think most of us have. x86 is, of course, one of them. Uh, ARM is another one. Um, Power, uh, Zarch, there's lots of other examples out there. Okay, but what they really are um, are a statement of the programmatic interfaces and um, low-level binary encodings, ones and zeros, that represent specific instructions that the machine will perform. Right. In other words, when you write your software and you compile your software, you are targeting a specific architecture that has a defined set of operations and behaviors. Uh, and it's the lowest level typically targeted by an application programmer, although increasingly today, maybe not with this audience, but increasingly today, uh, you know, people are writing software in much higher level languages that don't really target specific architectures. Um, we have some common concepts across the different architectures. We have the idea that when a program is running, we call it a process or a task. Programs run in a virtual memory environment. We'll talk more about that later. But um, at a high level, what we do is we create an abstraction. Every running program, on some level, thinks that it has an entire virtual machine to itself. Right? Doesn't have to worry about the placement of other programs uh, in memory. And we create interfaces to the operating system, uh, and we uh, perform system calls. We have these interfaces where an application can say to the operating system, I need your help doing something, opening a file, talking to some other process that isn't me, uh, and so on and so forth. Good evening, everyone. Wow, this is cool. OK. Um, operating system software makes use of additional instructions. So as I mentioned, when you write your software and you compile it with GCC or Clang or you know, some similar set of tools, tool chain, what happens is uh, your code is compiled into a sequence of instructions. Um, and there is an unprivileged ISA instruction set architecture uh, that applications target. And then there is a privileged ISA, privileged set of architectural instructions uh, that operating systems use. And it lets operating systems do things like uh, save the process state for running tasks um, and context switch between running tasks. Um, it also lets you do things like, uh, we'll talk more about this later, page faults. So if I am uh, using a virtual memory environment, I'm pretending I have this near limitless amount of memory in my machine, especially with 64-bit architectures. And uh, in order to create that illusion, underneath the hardware, uh, gives me various interfaces that let me say, when I'm trying to access memory, uh, you know, I may take a trap, I may take a fault into my operating system, and it may help out. And it has privileged uh, interfaces it can use uh, to help out with that. Examples of computer architectures, as I mentioned, uh, Intel uh, x86. Uh, it's quite an old architecture. It's evolved <laughs> a lot over the past 30 plus years. Um, Another architecture example is the ARM V8 architecture, which is much newer. Um, but they're both computer architectures. Both of them exist in real machines that you can buy. There are some differences between them. So in the former case, instructions are variable width. So the actual bits that get generated are variable width. In the case of ARM, it's what's called a RISC architecture. So the instructions are all the same width. Um, both of them have registers. These are little bits of memory inside the processor that are used to store values 
uh, while they're being added together or having other operations performed on them. Um, and there's some other differences between the two, uh, but I guess I don't have to go into too much detail there. Um, let's talk about implementation, right? So I talked about architecture. Let's talk about how you implement architecture. That's, that's known as microarchitecture. Um, before we get too much down that path, let me just show you a diagram here. So hopefully this works, yeah. So modern computer processors, we actually often refer to them as system on chip uh, designs because they have more than kind of the CPUs that you might uh, conceptualize. You might think that your software runs on a processor uh, and that's what it does uh, inside this chip. But actually these chips are quite complicated. Uh, modern chips have built-in memory interfaces. So these uh, DDR memory chips in your machine directly interface uh, to the microprocessor chip. Uh, each one of these chips has multiple cores on it. So I've got these labeled here, core one, core two. Um, and then each of these different cores, which are what we traditionally thought of as processors, are connected together. Uh, so in an eight core uh, CPU, uh, what you actually have there is all these different cores connected together, some kind of on-chip interconnect, um, and also uh, different levels of cache. So when I want to access memory on a modern processor, what will happen is some code running here inside one of my cores is going to say load a value from memory. What's actually going to happen is various stages of translation are going to happen to figure out where that memory lives, and then it's going to get pulled in from the DDR, in through the memory interface, into the last level cache, which is normally much bigger and slower, and it's going to work its way closer to the core, into the L2, and then into the L1 that's built into um, the core. And as it gets closer and closer to the core, uh, the amount of memory there is much smaller. Right? From, say, 32, 40 megabytes, some number like this, maybe even bigger at the last level, up uh, down to, let's say, 32 kilobytes or 64 kilobytes as we get much closer to the core. Uh, these are for fundamental laws of physics reasons. Uh, if you run memory faster, uh, then you, you, can, you, you, can have, you can have fast and small, or you can have slow and larger. Uh, but you can't have both, right? So what's a trade-off? Um, so programmers think of processors, um, but what they really mean normally are cores today. Some cores are multi-threaded, so they may further partition their resources into uh, these smaller units that we, we think of as, as threads. Um, and uh, they're integrated into these processor packages. As I mentioned, we have different levels of, of caching involved. And that's going to be important in a few minutes. So microarchitecture refers to a specific implementation of an architecture. So if I have an x86 uh, architecture, I could have many different ways that I could implement that or build an x86 machine. Um, and fundamentally, that's going to come down to the constraints that the design team was operating under. And those constraints can include things like uh, the amount of energy that they want to use in an implementation um, and the level of performance they want to have. These are all trade-offs. If I want to save energy, I may not get the performance that I, uh, may not get the same level of performance that I could get if I threw a lot more power, a lot more energy at a design. We'll talk more about this in a moment, but cores could be, for example, simple in-order machines. Um, they could also be much more complex out-of-order machines. So uh, what do I mean by that? Well, here's an example of, say, an in-order machine. This is kind of a classical, if you study computer science, this is a classical uh, five-stage pipeline in a machine. So for every instruction that we execute, we're going to read it from memory. We're going to figure out what it does. Uh, we're going to actually do whatever that is. We're going to access any memory or update any values that that instruction uh, needs to manipulate. Um, and then we're going to store that state back before we get to the next instruction. And this is how some of the earlier machines were implemented in the early days. Um, nothing wrong with doing things in order. 
It's what a lot of the uh, widgets, like your, your Fitbit or some embedded device that you're using, this is how they're still built today. But if we want to get more performance, we have to get a lot more aggressive in our design. Um, so in order, uh, microarchitectures, um, well, I guess this slide kind of repeats what I just said. Things are done uh, very simply uh, in, in order. And in fact, how programmers typically may conceptualize the code actually executing in their head. Um, here's a visualization of why in order can be uh, troublesome. Um, if I'm really lucky in an implementation, I could have five different instructions. So these represent five different instructions flowing through the machine. If I'm really lucky, I get to this one point where I sort of have this overlap uh, and I'm maximally using all the resources in my machine. But I have lots of other points where uh, I'm, I literally have dead space, right? So I, I don't get the kind of performance I could get from this design, but it is much simpler. I'll skip to, okay, it's about out of order. As I said, these slides are going to be online, and I have a lot of them, so I'm going to go quickly. So out of order machines uh, basically take your program that you think runs you know, in, in a sequence, do this and do this and do this, and actually what it does is it converts your program into something called a data flow model. So what it does is it takes advantage of a fundamental understanding that you can run a program in any order you like, provided that from the programmer's point of view, uh, everything finally appears to happen in the order that they wrote it. Right? Give an example of that. If I have a program which uh, loads two values and adds them together, okay, and then later on I set two values and add them together, in a, in a simple machine, what I might do, these are, these are register numbers in, um, in the machine. In a simpler machine, what I might do is say, well, I'm going to have to wait at this point here. I can't execute these instructions until these have completed. Because that's how the programmer wrote their code. Right? Do this, and then do this, and then do this. The problem is that there are different latencies involved here. So these loads are loading data from memory. I'm going to add those values together, but they're going to take some time. It's going to take some time for these values to come in from my external memory into the cache hierarchy inside my processor and get closer to my core where this addition is going to happen. And there's no actual explicit dependency here between these, this stage here and this stage here. So what I can do is I can actually execute those two parts of the program out of order inside the machine, as long as from the programmer's point of view, they don't see that. Right? That's known as out of order execution. I think I have a... Okay. We're being slow, but there we go. Okay. So the way I implement that inside a processor, as I mentioned, processors have these little registers that they store values they're currently working on. The way I implement this is I have something called a reorder buffer, or a, a ROB, and what that does is it keeps track of the different parts of my program and what state they're in and what the dependencies are between the different parts of my program. So what it can do is it can say, I can, I can uh, go ahead and take this entire program, I can put all the entries into my reorder buffer, and I can, con I can keep moving down through the program, uh, executing instructions once all their dependencies become uh, ready. So in the case of this code here, once I get these two loads, I can actually perform the addition. Right? I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to keep moving down through the program. I'm going to mark these as this instruction here as not able to proceed until these values have been loaded. So that's kind of a data flow model. That's what this is called. And if I make this reorder buffer large enough, I can actually get quite far down uh, continuing to execute instructions while I'm waiting uh, in particular for data to come in, uh, in order for the earlier instructions to make progress. One of the ways this is achieved also is by having uh, what's called a physical register file that's got many more registers than the actual architecture uh, defines. So you may have 15 registers in the case of x86, or you may have uh, 31 in the case of ARM, uh, but 
physically, there may be many more. Right? The reorder buffer is handling uh, who currently has which physical register assigned, which instruction is currently operating on that. Again, the programmer never sees this. The programmer thinks they're happily writing code using uh, what's defined in the architecture. But underneath, all this mechanics is happening. Uh, so out-of-order execution was actually invented back in 1967 by a guy called Robert Tomasulo, uh, who was at IBM. Um, he passed away a couple of years ago, um, and it's kind of interesting, or I've thought a lot about how uh, he missed all of this fun that's happening now, uh, which makes you wonder, you know, what would he have thought, and would he have had a revelation at some moment? Uh, but anyway, so he came up with this idea, and the reason he came up with it was uh, they were struggling to get the kind of performance they wanted from the floating point unit in the... Uh, IBM 360 mainframe, right? So he came up with this very clever idea. It's called Thomas Sula's algorithm. Uh, and then progressively, more and more of the industry has implemented this since, right? Pretty much every high-performance processor implements this. Um, this is one of the reasons why uh, vulnerabilities like the kind with speculation vulnerabilities like we're talking about today, that's the reason why they affect everyone, because everyone has had decades to implement this, right? Um, so, what Tomasulo, where we've kind of gone with uh, the Tomasulo concept is we have these reorder buffers. Um, they can be over 200 entries uh, in contemporary machines, so very large. Um, and what we'll do is we'll, we'll have a front end and a back end in our processor design. We'll take our program as the programmer wrote it, decode it in the front end of the machine, Convert it into, is this working? Convert it into more of a data flow model, like I explained here, tracking actual dependencies between instructions. And then what we'll do is we will retire it in order. The point of a reorder buffer is to complete instructions in the order the programmer wrote them, but not necessarily to execute them in the order the programmer wrote them. And so instructions will wait until their dependencies are available. <coughs> When they become the oldest in the machine, in, inside the processor, they are retired. That is that um, the results of their execution become what we call architecturally visible to programmers. Right? And actually what will happen in most machines is there'll be two register files, there'll be one that sort of captures internal state, what we're doing right now, and one that's architectural, that's as the programmer sees it. Uh, and one reason for this is something called precise exceptions, which basically means when you want to debug your code, uh, you as a programmer do not want to know what's going on inside, right? You really want to think, this instruction, this thing happened, then this thing happened, then this thing happened. If you had to actually understand what was really going on inside, that would make your life much harder. Uh, so we use terms like uh, UArch and microarchitecture to describe implementations. As I said, you could have two different x86 designs. For example, uh, the Atom processor series that Intel released uh, started out as an in-order implementation, much lower performing, but also lower power, um, and had different profiles that it was targeting from the much higher end, out-of-order, uh, superscalar processors like the, the Xeon series that people use in servers. Um, and we can talk about how big reorder buffers are, how many instructions they can have in flight, and so on. Here are examples of microarchitecture. Uh, the one on the left is a little bit older now, but it's the one in this laptop. That's why I cite it there. We can talk about how many instructions it has in flight. It's got a 224 entry reorder buffer. It's quite, a, quite large. Um, and we, on the right, we have another example of a microarchitecture, the IBM Power 8. And the interesting thing is, whilst they use different terms, they call it a global completion table, not a reorder buffer, um, we both have 224 entry uh, uh, ROBs in our designs. Right? Different implementations, same kind of concept. Okay, let's talk about virtual memory. As I mentioned, uh, when programs are running, uh, they are running inside this uh, environment that we create for them, uh, where we use virtual memory. Now, they think they have access to this very large amount of memory they can do whatever they want with. They don't have to worry about uh, what other applications are doing. Uh, and we have a defined interface uh, through system calls 
uh, by which running programs like Bash uh, can request services from the operating system. Right? And we all, we all know that, right? Um, right, let's skip that. Here's an example. Right? I've got a running process, and if I run this command on a Linux machine, I can actually look at uh, the memory that it sees, virtual memory. Uh, and when you go down through that, you'll see lists of libraries and other bits of code that your program is using, but what you won't see is other processes that are running in the machine, uh, because each one has its own concept of memory. Um, traditionally, though, what we would have um, is a memory, a virtual memory model in which uh, the program had whatever it wanted in the lower part, portion of memory, and the upper portion of virtual memory was the same for every running program. And what we did up here was we mapped the operating system. So Linux, does, Linux has a slightly different addressing than, than how Windows does it, and it varies from one architecture to another. But the idea is, when I want to, make, when I want to leverage some feature from the operating system, uh, it's, uh, th there can be very performant ways to do that if we have the same view of memory. Now, I have restrictions in place, so my application can't just go and trash the operating system, right? But uh, there, there is a portion of virtual memory uh, in every running program traditionally uh, that, that can be used to interface with the running kernel. Okay. The way we keep track of this is through something called page tables. So for every running pro so we have physical memory in the machine. This is your physical memory chips. Uh, and then we have page tables for every running program uh, that translate the view of memory it sees, where everything's nicely linear, beginning at zero, and working up to a very large address. Um, and what will happen is the page tables will contain translations that actually map that to where in physical memory uh, that lo memory location is located. We have another concept inside machines called a TLB, a translation look-aside buffer. And you'll find, actually, as we talk about these kind of vulnerabilities, um, that most of the time they're exploiting performance optimizations or uh, you know, extra features that we've added to machines. Right? So one example feature is uh, a TLB. And a TLB basically says, every time I need to access a memory location, rather than go and look at this page table and work it all out, what I can do is I can cache the last few such translations um, that a program was using. So the last time that it tried to access this memory location here, it actually went here. Uh, rather than perform this expensive operation every time, I can cache it inside the chip um, and answer that very quickly. Um, so memory addresses are translated before they reach actual memory. Um, we have this concept of a virtual address and a physical address. Just remember those two things. Uh, and then we have all kinds of fancy hardware that actually, we call them page walkers, they actually walk through these tables and understand how to perform these translations. Now, whenever we switch from one running program to another, one running process to another, we also have to go and switch out which set of tables we're using so that each program has its own view of memory. Um, and as I mentioned, this gives applications their own notion that they have uh, this almost infinite range of virtual memory to themselves. Okay. Um, I think I put this slide in here just to give you, again, a reminder of what I said before. You've got memory interfaces moving up through your cache. Um, you've got addresses being translated as, they, as memory moves closer to the core. Okay. Okay, so how do caches work? Well, when I'm running, when, when my code is running, uh, and it tries to access a memory location, so these are virtual addresses. Uh, in addition to having a translation and saying, uh, you know, I, I've got this, this location here that actually maps to, I don't know, somewhere over here. Um, what we also might want to do is, is uh, assist with basically being able to load these values faster, right? What caches do is they keep a, a second copy or multiple copies of the data that's in physical memory uh, so it's closer to the processor where it can be accessed faster. Um, and the principle of low-key, uh, locality of reference, says that data you have used recently, you will probably use again. Right? That's why caches are a good idea. Um, traditionally, 
in processors, uh, as I mentioned, we would have this one view of virtual memory, and you'd have some kernel addresses at the top and some application addresses at the bottom. Um, they could both result in uh, entries in the cache, um, but we have other restrictions in place that would say, well, yeah, I might be caching some kernel data uh, in the cache, uh, but the application can't access that memory location, so it's safe. Right? I have a cache, it keeps values, uh, they'll refer to anything that's in virtual memory, both for the application and for the memory that's mapped for the kernel. Um, this is a, maybe I'll skip this slide, but this is a little bit more detail in how uh, caches are actually indexed, so they're actually divided. Uh, you, you look up the virtual address, you look up the physical address, there's some optimizations involved. Um, so, I'm going to skip that slide as well. Keep us on time. Uh, and, well, I, I think the only thing I want to mention on this slide is that um, there's many different ways to design caches, right? But fundamentally, uh, I take a virtual address and I translate it into a physical address, and at the same time, I look up whether I have it in my cache um, as I'm uh, accessing it. Okay. I want to keep moving here because I need to give Andrea the time that he needs. Um, I've given a three-hour version of this talk. That's why I'm trying to, <laughs> trying, to be, trying to be fast, right? So let's talk about side channel attacks. So um, in computer security... I'm going to read this quote here. A side channel attack is any attack based on information gained from the physical implementation of a computer system rather than weaknesses in the implemented algorithm itself. Right? So, in other words, if I have a little widget and its job in life is to encrypt information, right? there are, there are multiple ways that I can go about trying to break into that widget. Well, the first thing I'm going to do, as XKCD tells me, is I'm going to go find the inventor, and I'm going to threaten them, and they're going to say, okay, here's the key, right? That's, that's actually how it's going to go in, 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 in real life. But secondarily, what I could do, instead of embarking on an elaborate effort to break all these crypto algorithms, is I could just monitor the device. And so it's quite common in the industry that people will do what's called differential power analysis, and they will say, well, when I'm adding two values together or multiplying two values together, I use different amounts of power for different operations. And if I measure that very carefully, I can actually see what the chip is doing inside. Uh, and so, you know, side channel attacks are not new. Uh, they've been used to attack many different systems over time. We're going to talk today about a particular class of side channel, but the concept is not new. Uh, and most famously, I think, one of the examples is something called Tempest, it used to be very popular in hacker circles, and these days is a bit less, but people are nodding, so they've, they've heard of this, right? This is the idea that, and it's actually true, um, if you have your tinfoil hat, this is the idea that the government is sitting outside in vans with very fancy arrays of antennas, and they're dumping all the data on your screens. Uh, except it is true on some level, and it has been demonstrated that you can do this. There was a talk at DEF CON a few years ago where uh, the, uh, the lady giving the talk uh, had a software-defined radio, and she was actually reconstructing what was being displayed on a laptop across the room. So you, you, you can do this. Um, and you can also attack uh, computer systems through the cache hierarchy uh, by timing operations. We're going to talk about that next. So I mentioned caches a few times, and I mentioned that they exist because data we have used recently uh, will probably be used again, right? So a fundamental property of caches is that they make things faster. And the inverse of that means that the fundamental property of caches is that if something is not in the cache, um, it is slower to access, right? What I can do is I can actually time the access, the time it takes to perform a memory access, um, and by measuring how long that takes, I can actually determine if something was in the cache or not. Right? Now, why is that useful? Well, let's look at it. Um, so, if you look at this code here, just uh, at a high level, we have two memory locations. If you guys are not C programmers, don't worry too much. I have two different memory locations here, uh, an array. 
And what I'm going to do is I'm going to read this. this uh, there's an instruction in the x86 architecture called RDTSC, read timestamp counter. It gives me a very precise uh, value of current time. Right? What I can do then is perform a memory access, and I can measure the delta between the timestamp I read after and the timestamp at the beginning. Um, and the execution time for that instruction is proportional to whether it's in the cache or not. So if this, if this value is in the cache and this value is not, then the time here will be measurably different between these two operations. Okay. Um, some, in some architectures also give you the ability to flush entries from the cache. So x86 has something called CL flush, which is an unprivileged instruction that you can use to flush an entry. Um, and actually, the amount of time it takes for CL flush to happen uh, is also proportional to whether it was in the cache or not. So it, it, it gets very interesting. Um, so many architectures provide convenient, high-resolution, cycle-accurate timestamp counters. Right? Uh, men, most of them provide this in an unprivileged way because a lot of application software needs to measure time. Right? But the key thing I want you to also take away is that's not needed for the exploits I'm going to talk about next. There are other ways that you can measure time without these. This just happens to make it much easier. Um, and I've said most of this on the slide. OK. Uh, there's some other variants of this. So some processors will also provide a convenient means to say, I plan to use this value. Uh, so why don't you pull it into the cache ahead of time? Right? Lots of fun things we can do with caches. Um, I'm going to switch topic yet again, and then this is all going to come back together in a moment. Let's talk about branch prediction. So when I'm running code uh, on a high-performance processor, and I hit a condition, such as, uh, is it raining? Um, traditionally, in the early days of computers, what I would do is uh, I would hit a point where I need to know is, is, is value of raining true or false, and I would stop, and I would wait while that value got fetched from memory. Right? Um, and then based on that value, I would, the program execution would go one way or another. Uh, and the problem there is um, I'm trying to execute billions of instructions per second, and I'm hitting a point in the code where I don't know which way I'm going to go. Right? And what I don't want to do is sit around and do nothing. Because sitting around doing nothing wastes a lot of time. So what I want to do is I want to predict which way this program is going to go. Right? If I'm right, I get a performance speed up. If I'm wrong, then what I'm going to have to do is make sure I carefully implement my processor so that I can undo everything I did uh, such that you can't tell that, that I, I tried going down the wrong branch. So we have a concept called branch prediction in modern processors. Uh, and what it does is it keeps track of uh, these conditional uh, points. Uh, it keeps track of history. Uh, and the uh, process of determining uh, a branch is known as resolving a branch. Right? I may not immediately know which way I'm going to go, because I may have to wait some time for that value to come in. So what I can do is I can come back to my reorder buffer diagram I had before, but I can now divide my reorder buffer into two pieces. Got five more minutes. All right, let's keep going. Um, and what I can do is I can say, when I hit a branch here, I don't know. Uh, th so this is, this is one half of my branch, right? If, if, uh, if this value is, is 0, do this. Otherwise, I'm going to have something else further down, right? I don't know if I'm going to execute these instructions here or not. But based on this piece of hardware, this branch predictor, uh, and, and what the program did previously, I'm going to guess that it is going to run, uh, it is going to continue, and it is going to execute these instructions. So what I do is I put my processor, I add another column here, I put my processor into the state called uh, speculation. right? And what, what speculative execution does is it says, not only do I have a reorder buffer and I'm running everything out of sequence 
from any concept of how the programmer wrote it, but I'm also guessing what part of the code is going to run next. And I'm going to tag it very carefully here. I've made it purple, so I definitely know uh, that it's uh, speculative, right? That's how we do things. Um, and I'm going to keep track internally of everything the program does. And if I get this wrong here, I'm going to throw all of this away, and I'm going to unwind the entire state back to where I was here. And I'm going to do it in a way that the programmer can't detect. The programmer has no knowledge of this. This is how we've done things for years. This layer is on Tomasulo, as you can see. It's just an extra column in this diagram. Uh, it's, it's relatively simple to add this mechanism once you already have the, the Tomasulo apparatus. Um, so usually, uh, you'll do it in out-of-order machines. You'll speculatively tag instructions, and you'll say, I think I'm going to keep going down this part of the branch. Once the branch is successfully resolved, if I was correct, great. I can retire those instructions. They're all completed. They're all ready to go. I make a lot of progress. Um, if I'm wrong, then I have to unwind um, everything I did there. But the idea is it doesn't take much longer than just waiting around for that branch to resolve in the first place. So there's lots of benefits to, to branch prediction. Different types of branches in the machine. So you can have conditional branches or, or conditional direct branches, like a simple loop. Uh, you know, load some value, uh, run a loop through 10 times, uh, do something. Um, and what I can do is, uh, over time, the processor is going to, is going to realize that um, I very, very often will be running through this loop. So um, it's going to guess that, yes, I'm going to actually loop back again. Um, and it's going to uh, you know, potentially get much further ahead uh, than it knows uh, the program is, 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 is uh, than, than architecturally it knows the program has reached. In reality, we have something called a loop predictor, so you wouldn't even do this. Uh, and what we do is, inside the processor, we have uh, different states we track for each running process. So when I'm running a program, this is an instruction address. So when I'm running a program and it hits a particular instruction, it's a branch that's a, a test to go one way or another, what I'm going to do is, I'm going to take the address of that branch instruction and I'm going to store some history for it. Right? So what I'm going to do is I'm going to take this particular branch and I'm going to say, well, the last few times it was taken, it was not taken, it was taken, it was not taken, and so on. Um, and I'm going to track this uh, in a branch in a history table inside my processor. Now, Andre will talk more about this, but because I don't have infinite amounts of uh, available uh, implementation space in my processor, uh, and because programs these days are very large, I can't track every branch uniquely. So what I'm going to actually have is some kind of hashing function inside the processor, and it's going to say that uh, given the right set of circumstances, uh, a branch in two different programs may actually uh, end up storing an entry in the same location in this history table. All right. This has been well known in computer architecture for decades, but the way we've always thought about it is this is there's some level of interference here, but it's not significant. Okay. And as I mentioned, branch behavior is rarely random. Uh, we can get a 99% accuracy um, with today's branch predictors. Uh, some of them get even more fancy uh, because it turns out that uh, you, you, you take significant performance hit, uh, even if you get your branch predictor down to 95% accurate. Um, skip that one. I'll talk about indirect branch prediction. Another kind of branch in your program is not a straightforward conditional, do I go true or false? Another kind of branch in your program is go from here to anywhere else. Right? Um, and, and that could happen if you write a lot of C++ code, uh, and you have uh, the ways that we actually implement C++ programs, we may end up with these giant tables um, of, of virtual function addresses, and I may just jump to an arbitrary location uh, in my program. What the indirect predictor tries to do um, is it tries to keep track of these indirect jumps, jump to anywhere. 
Uh, and these have gotten pretty sophisticated as well. Again, there's a lot of benefit in performance to doing this, so they've put the time and the investment in. Uh, and they will speculate that I go from this point in my program to some other arbitrary location, and the speculation machine will actually keep running uh, you know, based, on, based on history, based on saying, last time I hit this jump, I went there. Um, talked about optimization, I'm going to keep going. Uh, I think I've talked about speculation, I'm going to keep going. So let's talk about how Meltdown and Spectre fit into this. I've given you guys a lot of kind of computer science material by way of introduction. Let's talk about Meltdown. Um, so, you know, these two uh, vulnerabilities I'm going to go into now, are two, or, well, three, I guess, um, they were discovered in some of these this fundamental mechanics that we use in the industry. Right? They were discovered by multiple parties, and they affect multiple architectures because we use common optimizations across the industry. So our job here um, is to try not to panic um, and throw away all of our performance toys, uh, but to find ways to still get the performance that we're used to. Right? So Meltdown is an interesting uh, example of Thomas Zulo gone awry. Um, if, we bring, if I bring back the slide I had earlier, okay, I'll go back a bit further. This will make jumping back even more exciting. But that's okay. That's all right. We'll, it'll be worth it. What we want to ask ourselves is, if we keep running through this program, well, actually, I'll, I'll go to the, the purple version of that. Because it'll be easier to come back. OK. If I keep running through my program, what happens if um, I reach a point in my program where I'm not sure I'm going to execute the following instructions? I'm guessing that I am. What happens if one of these instructions does something that it shouldn't? What happens if it tries to load from an address in memory to which it doesn't have access? Right? Now, in a classical implementation of Thomas Sulo, what you do is you handle what are called exceptions, bad things, um, at retirement. You handle them when this instruction actually completes and becomes architecturally visible. What you do is you say, speculation is a black box. No one can see it. It doesn't matter. Um, so what you do is you tag the instruction here. You add another column. There's actually a lot more of these. <laughs> um, and you have a column there that says, this instruction did something bad. Right? Um, and depending on your implementation, you may not stop immediately. You might keep running. Because again, we're speculating. We're not actually... Uh, making this visible to the programmer, or well, that's how we think things are. Uh, and what we're going to say is, when we get to the end here, when we decide that this was or was not the code we should have run, then we're going to handle whatever bad thing happened. If this was part of a branch that we ended up not taking, we can't take we can't handle any exception. We can't handle anything bad that it did because it never happened. Right? We can't just stop immediately and crash the program because we don't know that that code was supposed to run. What we can do is we can handle the fault when it becomes apparent to us that that code was supposed to run. Otherwise, we throw it away. So the problem with Meltdown uh, is that if we can see inside that speculation, inside that speculation window, uh, then we can do bad things. So here's a piece of malicious code. Similar to what's on the, the shirt, but not quite. Uh, <laughs> I can access some memory location to which I do not, I should not have access. Right? Now, if this code ever runs, becomes architecturally visible, it's going to crash. Right? That's what the first instruction on this shirt does. Right? It actually does a null pointer to reference. It's going to crash the moment that this code retires. But in the time that we're speculating ahead. Inside the speculation window, we might continue to execute the following instructions. Now, as I mentioned, when I talked about caching, 
you can perform timing attacks based on whether something is in the cache or not. So what Meltdown does is it says, I'm going to take this bad data that I don't have access to, and then I'm going to perform some other access to some other memory location that I do have access to, some little buffer that my program legitimately has access to. And legitimately, my program has arranged ahead of time that none of that is in the cache. So what I can do outside of this malicious code, I think I put it on the next slide. Uh, no. But what I can do outside of this is I can then perform a timing analysis of two possible locations in, my, uh, in, 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 in memory that I do have access to in order to infer the memory that I don't have access to. All right? So I can take advantage of how caches are implemented. So here's a, here's a way I can do it. Uh, choose a value that I want to read. Take, choose one bit, because it's, it's easier to just think in terms of one single value. Right? Choose a bit of that uh, memory that I want to read, um, and then perform some access based on that. And then look to see which of these two values got loaded into the cache. And that is visible, because the speculation still performed memory access, and it still updated the cache. Right? The designers always thought that this was not visible, but actually it turns out that it is. So, um, you know, if, if uh, well, I, I think this is a, a good, yeah. So based on, uh, based on the access, I'm going to pull one of two different locations into the cache, right? And I can measure that. And the problem is um, that that map memory might be kernel memory. It might be memory that I'm not um, authorized to access. So now what I can do is I can infer the contents of kernel memory. Um, and as I mentioned, I can use a piece of code like this, and I can perform a timing analysis, and I can slowly extract uh, the contents of memory locations that I do not have permission to access. Okay. These slides will be online, so you can read through this in more detail. Right? And it will show you here what I do to manipulate and extract this data. Um, so as I said before, when the right conditions exist, this branch of code will execute speculatively. We will do a privilege check to see if we should access that data. Uh, it will fail. We will tag it as such, but we will continue to execute instructions speculatively, pulling data into our caches that we can observe. That's, that's the side channel piece, right? I can't read the data directly, but I can observe what accessing it did. So for meltdown to work, um, I have to have translations, virtual memory translations for data that I want to read. Um, and in some cases, it has to also, uh, the bad data that I want to read already has to be in the cache. So the primary mitigation that Andrea will talk about is making sure that we never actually have that uh, kernel data, that privileged data, in the virtual memory at the time, so we can never get away with performing this attack. He'll talk more about that. I'm going to keep going, because I need to close this out. Um, so Spectre. Spectre is another set of uh, microarchitectural attacks. Um, there are two different kinds of Spectre attacks. Spectre variant 1 says, uh, I'm going to hit a point in my code where I, do, I take some data from uh, a user. So this could be an operating system code that runs in response to some uh, application request. I'm going to take some data. I'm going to test to see if it lies within some permitted set of values. Uh, but unfortunately, what I might do is I might speculatively execute beyond that bounds check. I might keep going before I know whether I should. And what I can do is, you know, this code looks a bit like before. Um, I can construct little widgets that look a lot like those, those meltdown widgets. I can perform cache accesses um, uh, you know, based on uh, code that should, should, uh, should not have executed. And if I can therefore arrange, if I can find some piece of code, vulnerable code sequence, we call these gadgets, um, that happens to do something like this, I can use it to construct ways to read certain memory. Uh, variant 1 is very hard to pull off. Meltdown's gotten a lot of attention because it's much easier to reproduce. Um, but uh, Spectre Variant 1 is, is something that we really just have to scan through code and look for vulnerable code sequences. 
um, we mitigate it by putting uh, serializing instructions. x86 calls them fences, but effectively what we do is we say, we're going to do some check here. We're going to put a, a special instruction in the code, so we have to change our compilers, or we have to actually insert these code sequences. And we're going to say, this looks like a suspiciously vulnerable code sequence. I'm going to insert this. And of course, that gets expensive because programmers have to be aware of doing this. We have to write fancy scanning tools. There's lots of things we need to do. This is hard. Fortunately, it's very hard to exploit as well. So, so that's good. Um, Spectre variant two, and then I'm going to hand to Andrea. Um, as I mentioned before, you could have two locations uh, in two running programs um, that, uh, for various reasons of implementation, could actually uh, both index into the same location in your branch history. Uh, so by carefully arranging the execution of one program, you can actually do what's called training a branch predictor. You can train it so that when it runs some code in a different program, uh, it's going to guess that the branches are going a particular way. Uh, and so uh, Spectre Variant 2 says that we may be susceptible to poisoning branch predictors uh, training them in one context and abusing them in another context. And then we have to look for specific uh, vulnerable code sequences that perform some access that we can exploit and we can time. Uh, so again, Spectre Variant 2 is pretty hard to pull off, but um, by, uh, by performing this kind of training, I can actually uh, extract some data from, from, uh, from privileged code. Um, the mitigation for Spectre Variant 2 uh, is, uh, well, it, it, it's multiple different options. I can change how I design my branch predictor so that I can tag based on a fully disambiguated context. So I say this, this process is different from this one, and there's no way that they both hash into the same place. Um, or if I can't go and change all my hardware, what I can do is I can flush the branch predictor state, and Andrea will talk about how we do that in Linux. Um, I'm going to hand over to you now, Andrea, because I've got more, and this could go for hours, but I'm going to hand to you. So Andrea's going to talk about how we go from what these attacks are to how we mitigate them in Linux. And then we'll take questions at the end, so we can get into as much depth as you like, and we can uh, take it to the bar as well, if that's interesting. Oh, you don't need this, do you? No, I don't. You don't? Okay. Thank you, John. All right, cool. Okay, much better this time. The first time it didn't work. <laughs> so, uh, so the attack here, uh, all these attacks, are uh, effectively read-only. So you're not going to get uh, uh, any memory possibly modified. This is no risk of uh, uh, any change to disk data or memory. So <clears throat> it's effectively a problem mostly if you have uh, untrusted code not, uh, which, which is running on your machine. So I'm going to talk, of course, about the practical aspects of uh, these and where exactly you should be worried about these problems. And again, it's when you have untrusted code running on your machine. If you're running your own program on your machine, your program is not trying to do this kind of things to create side channels and exploit the problems in the hardware which John just described. So in some ways, it's less serious than DLT Core, which is a software bug. It's not uh, an hardware feature. Uh, and uh, DLT Core could actually modify everything. Could even, you know, if you have a vulner vulnerability in the BIOS, you could even try to attack the BIOS. These things cannot. These are read-only issues. And so there is only leak of information, of course, through the side channel. And uh, most important, the KVM guest host isolation. So if the untrusted code was running in the guest, would have avoided most of these attacks, except variant two, Spectre variant two. But it, for example, meltdown is absolutely impossible to attack from the guest into the host memory. So the guest stays isolated, and meltdown is 
no operational as far as the guest host isolation is concerned if you're using KVM. I don't know about other hypervisor. Actually, I know, but I'd rather not mention it. <laughs> so <clears throat> we have uh, several mitigations. Some of these are completely software-based, like page table isolation and red polyms. Uh, and then we have uh, CPU and microcode features, which you need to inject into the hardware simply by updating the CPU microcode, uh, which uh, are going to be provided. Uh, some of these actually are not the one without the dash. Uh, so actually, load fences, these don't require the microcode update. We see where we need those. But all the others, IBRS, which means indirect branch restricted speculation, IBPB, indirect branch prediction barrier, and ST STIBP, single thread indirect branch predictor, these things are provided by the new microcode. By the way, it's not my idea to call these things in such, in such a way. These are from the specification from the CPU vendors. We generally use the acronym, so IBRS, IBPB. I think it's kind of simpler. Eventually, you remember it. <laughs> it takes a bit. Uh, so we also have many new fun acronyms, which I'm, go, which I'm going over, because they will show up during the talk later. So I'd rather explain it right now. So we have NX. This is a very old feature. It's not executable. So generally in Linux, the stack is not executable because it will have this NX bit. Then we have uh, supervisor mode execution protection, SMAP. SMAP is a feature. It's an hardware feature in the latest Intel CPUs, which prevents uh, the kernel to execute uh, user land code effectively. It's similar to the not execute, but it's not about not executing. Everything is only not executing user land bytecode when you're running in the kernel. Then we have PCID. PCID is also a new feature. Well, not really so new because it's from any CPU above uh, Westmere. So almost uh, eight years ago or something. Um, this feature is quite important to optimize PTI, which is a mitigation for meltdown. And uh, we have inv, uh, PCID, invalidate PCID, which is also going to accelerate further the PTI implementation. And this one is available from any Aswell CPU or more recent. And then we have something called PGD, which is actually a software concept. It's not an hardware part, this one. It's uh, a page global directory. It's uh, the top level of the page tables. And then we have hyperthreading which is, of course, HT, and kernel address space layout randomization. This is the same thing you have effectively in user land. When you map a library, user land tries to map it in a random location to make it, uh, to make it harder to use uh, a kind of rope programming or anyway, any kind of exploit. So it makes things more secure to put bytecode at a random location. So the idea here is to do the same thing in the kernel. So from any RHEL 7 uh, that will be released in the future, it will be always enabled by default. In RHEL 7.4, it was provided. You can enable it with the command line option at boot time. Uh, Berkeley packet filter. This one uh, is used in the kernel, especially recently, in so many different ways. It's, uh, it's a reason interpreter and just-in-time compiler in the kernel. And so we generally call it BPF, but you can imagine it like a small virtual machine or a small interpreter inside the kernel. Then we have speculation control. It's a new MSR, and it's the MSR which, provided, which is provided by the new microcode. Uh, Reverse-oriented programming, ROP, is a technique used in the past for uh, attacking programs with not executable stacks. In this case, the Spectre variant 2, like John also mentioned in a previous slide, is going to do something similar, because you can execute little pieces, except <laughs> those old attacks, they were actually executing it for real. In our case, we only execute it during speculative execution, so it becomes effectively, it was supposed to be invisible, it's actually, unfortunately, visible. So let's start with page table isolation. So uh, this uh, patch set uh, initially called Kaiser, now it's page table isolation, it's, but conceptually it's the same design. 
It started to be discussed on Linux kernel mailing list around November uh, of last year. And the idea with PTI is to change uh, the memory management of the kernel so that it maps uh, the user land virtual address space with the shared OPGD. So effectively, you will have two different sets of page tables for the kernel and for the user land. And the whole idea is not to map the kernel memory when you're running in user land. We see it with some more easy to understand figures in this slide. This is the standard way Linux has always worked, except for some 32-bit kernel in the past. But on the x86-64, uh, 64-bit, this has always been the standard design in Linux. So you have user land running in the first 47 bits of the other space, and then you have the kernel running in the last negative part of the other space. And uh, you can see it's 0xffff8, uh, and then all 0, that's where the kernel mapping can start. And all the memory was mapped, it's called the direct mapping, in this kernel space. Your program, uh, while it's running, it will run in virtual memory in the green part in the user space. So the idea of the meltdown attack is that it's using this pointer that John just showed, it's even on the back of the t-shirt, it's trying to read from that address in old RAM and trying to get uh, this data used in the speculative execution. So the issue is uh, we cannot really stop it. And so it means there is no fix. But what we can do is to actually not map the kernel into that place. So what we do is to create a second mapping for the user land so that when you're running in user land, and this is the shadow user mode PGD. Told you PGD uh, is the top level of the page table. So with this green space, when the, current, when the user land is running, if user land tries to attack the kernel, it will just read a few kilobytes of kernel memory that don't contain any interesting information whatsoever. There might be some pointers, but that's about it. I mean, there's no way to get DM crypto keys. There's no way to get uh, all the data in, the old, in all other processes that are running in the, in the host. So it's just a few kilobytes, and they just contain a, mi a minimal uh, per CPU trampoline stack, kernel stack. I mean, the CPU needs a stack to run, right? So. Uh, we need to switch to kernel mode and have a kernel stack. This is something the CPU does in hardware when you do a syscall and the privilege change. So we absolutely need a stack, but we lose a tiny temporary stack where we will immediately jump out of it as soon as we switch to the kernel PGD. So the first thing which happens when there is a syscall with PDI is to change the trampoline stack and actually have, uh, and, and also the PGD so that then you can run normally again. And then when you run normally again, you're going also to run with the user and memory mapped not executable. So it will, PTI, when NX is provided by the hardware, will also provide some, a feature like SMAP. So it will make it impossible to execute user land, which will actually help for, for uh, another issue. So this is what PTI is, and it can uh, and also be used with PTI on, so this is a parameter. And it, by default, it will be automatically enabled on all the CPU affected by a meltdown. So not all the x86-64 CPUs out there are. So only on those where uh, you have the problem, PDI will be enabled. So there is a cons, of course. Uh, it's, uh, it's lower when you're running the syscall, because like I said, uh, once there is a syscall here, so there will be a little bit of adjustment to do especially in the change of the PGD, which will require a TLB flash or a PCID change. That's why the PCID helps here, because with PCID, we don't have to run the TLB flash in this transition. Uh, and then it will be uh, more secure, however, when you have KASLR, CASL, I don't know exactly how to pronounce it. Anyway, uh, this uh, randomization works much better with PTI on because there's no uh, kernel mapped in, uh, when you're running in user land, so it's much harder to probe uh, 
and just get those tiny pieces of kernel memory mapped while you're running in user land during an attack on a castle. So there is a pros, not only meltdown fix, but also are more hard to exploit. But this is only an hardening feature. So generally speaking, just enabling PDI to incre increase the CASR uh, doesn't seem to be worth it because it's quite expensive. It's a couple of percentage points. We'll see it later. Uh, especially if you don't have PCID because with PCID, PTI is quite slower. With PTID, it's faster. With PGID, it's even faster. So like I said before, uh, PCID features and in PCID are two hardware things which definitely help to make PTI much faster. And you can check it in slash proc slash CPU info if you have those. It's, the difference between upstream and downstream here is uh, with the downstream kernel of some enterprise distribution, you can, <laughs> you can enable and disable PTI at runtime. So, like I said, if you have PCD, the override is not big. But let's assume you actually have an enterprise distribution running on an EHLM, which doesn't have PCID. Then the performance hit of changing the PGD when you do the syscall is going to be quite measurable. So, you don't have to reboot the machine. You just have to set echo zero PTI enabled. Maybe you don't have any untrusted program running in the host. Or maybe the host is just running virtual machines. Like I said before, KVM doesn't have any problem with meltdown. So there's no way a meltdown attack on the gas can attack the host in any possible way. So maybe you can decide to disable PTI in the host. Uh, so that's pretty much it for meltdown. And uh, we can switch to the load fences. And the load fences are uh, related to Spectre Variant 1. Uh, the attack of uh, uh, Spectre Variant 1 is uh, a bound check which is being delayed and you start executing the reference of an array beyond the bound check. Uh, and so how do you stop it? Well, it turns out there are already instructions in the CPU called the load fences which can act as speculation memory barriers. And in the upstream kernels is new load fence memory barrier, which stops Spectre variant 1, is called barrier null spec. And uh, uh, in addition to that, it's, uh, uh, it's being also implemented, uh, for example, in drivers. And the Spectre variant 1 is quite different also from Meltdown because it requires knowledge of the kernel code running. While with Meltdown, no. With Meltdown, just, just start using point, random pointers over the kernel, and you can still dump everything. In this case, to attack Meltdown, to make an attack on the kernel, you need to know exactly which kernel code is running in the host or in the gas if, you, if the attack is happening on the gas, of course. And uh, for example, bi BIOS and binary blobs cannot be scanned and patched. So, uh, so there's nothing really which would prevent it if it happens in the BIOS, but you would need to know the content of the BIOS. So again, if you run in a virtual machine, things are kind of safer because there's no way to use the BIOS. Because this attack variant one also cannot bypass uh, virtual machines. Generally speaking, at least. And uh, uh, there are a few differences how the problem will solve it downstream and upstream. So upstream, like I say, there is bar in non-spec and there is array index non-spec, which again can be used for, should be used for the bound checks whenever the parameter of the bound check is untrusted data. So like, a, 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 I don't know, a value from an IO control, which is pushing into the kernel and used for the bound check. And uh, currently, in the 416 kernel, it's called only in six places, this function. So we can expect probably way more of these bound checks being implemented with the implicit barrier no spec, eh, which will solve the problem. And uh, another way uh, that variant one was being attacked, in, in actually in a mix between variant one and variant two, if you check the, the proof of concept uh, attack uh, on KVM, they used the BPF interpreter in the host kernel, and they executed it speculatively. <laughs> 
So upstream, so you simply disable the BPF. So uh, the interpreter. You can still use the JIT, but the interpreter is basically disabled, and that's kind of solved the problem. Uh, because there was many of these bound checks you could use uh, in the interpreter. And in downstream instead, what we're using is a scanner. So there can be many of these gadgets, right? So we are not going immediately to preview in one month. We, we had very little time to prepare and ship this fix in production. We cannot preview millions of lines of code of any driver out there that we ship in such a short period. So we need a scanner. And, uh, and a few places, like the BPF uh, uh, interpreter, have, have been fixed explicitly. So instead of disabling it, we put explicit uh, load fences in the BPF. Then we are also investigating in a, an assembly scanner. Of course, this is all open source, uh, the, the, our research on the assembly. And then we have uh, a false positive, uh, of course, uh, from the scanner. So many of these places that the scanner will find the gadgets, they are not all untrusted because the scanner doesn't have enough intelligence to know if the parameter of the bound check is really untrusted or trusted. It just finds this kind of gadgets where this thing might happen, where Spectre Variant 1 might happen, but it doesn't have enough intelligence to exactly know which ones are really exploitable. But we found there's absolutely no performance impact in fixing them all. So again, to be sure, we fix them all. Uh, so let's move to other pieces of the CPU which create problems, and this case is actually related to Spectre Variant 2. So there is uh, two parts of the CPU, which John, of course, also part talked about, which are the BDB and RSB. And they are the ones which create the problem for Spectre Variant 1. And the branch target buffer is the BDB, and the return stack buffer is a RSB. The branch target buffer can be shared between hyperthreads. Can you imagine that sharing stuff between hyperthread might cause problems eventually? Well, it did. And then we have RSB, which is actually a fixed stack. So you only can push and pop from the stack. And there, the BDB has different structures uh, fixed uh, anyway. It's not a stack just contains addresses. And the BTB doesn't store the full 64 bits. Like John said before, it's, it's, an, it's an ash. It's kind of ashed and it can lose some bits. So the BTB and RSB are not flashed while changing privilege level. They are not indexed by the privilege level, like John said, too. And uh, this is really the source of the problem. So BTB affects indirect jumps and indirect call instruction. The RSB affects the red instruction. So you have effectively three instructions, indirect jump, indirect call, and red, which are the source of the problem of Spectre Variant 2. Every virtual method, like C++, or, or even, even in the kernel, because of course the, the main target here is always the kernel. I mean, if you can own the kernel, you know own the whole machine, right? So, uh, the kernel is in C, and every pointer to function is using one of these. Generally, indirect call, in this case, a pointer to function. So we implement objects in the kernel using pointers to functions. And the problem with uh, uh, these uh, BDB and LSB is uh, that uh, there can be uh, some privilege level, some program, maliciously, creating poison inside this BDB and uh, RSB to affect the runtime of the application. It's all about the poison, basically. And the predictor mode and privilege mode change are one way of attacking it. So it can be the guest user attacking the guest kernel. Or it can be the guest kernel attacking the host kernel. Or it can be the host user land attacking the host kernel. So it can be, the attack can happen through this poison in a privilege change. Or it can also happen at the same privilege through a content switch. Could be one process attacking another process. Or it can attack th through hyperthreads, which means it can be two 
pieces of software running in the same core in two different siblings attacking each other. And then it can also happen that the guest is attacking a, a host process. So it can happen in many different ways. Actually, three, I say. And then we see the first way. And that's the predictor mode privilege, la privilege level change. So the current CPU don't know anything about this. And that's pretty much why we have the problem. The future CPU, of course, will know. So we set a new flag called IBRS all. We'll set it at boot, and then everything is going to run great, and we don't have any slowdown and everything. But right now, the CPU doesn't know about it. So what happens is we have this uh, poison created by your application in the guest user. This is an example, of course. So again, since these levels are guest user, so it's, it's like here you have a virtual machine and, and below you have the host, right? So you have four levels where you have user landing in the virtual machine and the kernel in the virtual machine and then the user land in the host, in the bare metal, and the kernel in the bare metal. So the poison is being created at the lowest privilege level, which is, of course, a guest user. And then there is a, a syscall. The guest program will run syscall, which will switch to guest kernel, and the poison is still there in the CPU and start affecting the runtime of the guest kernel. Then there will be a VM exit, which goes back to the host, and the poison is still there affecting the host kernel. And then the host kernel may actually switch uh, to QEMU, and the poison can affect QEMU as well. So how do we fix it? Well, we have two ways. And, uh, one is microcode based and it's a spec control MSR. Like I said, you need to load the new microcode in the CPU. And this will make the CPU immune from the poison. So you just have to set a bit in an MSR and the problem is practically solved. Or you can just rebuild everything. So in our case, we build the kernel with this technique called the Repolin. The whole point of Repolin is to stop using indirect jumps everywhere and indirect calls. So we stop using these instructions. We never do an indirect jump or an indirect call. Instead, we use the red instruction to pop the address from the stack and do the indirect jump with the red instruction. And uh, however, the red instruction must, must be guaranteed safe after 32 dummy calls, which fills us B, because like I told you before, the red instruction is also popping information from the RSB. So before the red instruction is actually safe to use for the repolin, we also have to flash the RSB. So once we flash the RSB and we use the red instruction, we say, yeah, we, we, we removed any kind of poison. We are not affected by the poison anymore, and we are safe. So even when we use repolin, though, we still need IBRS to cover uh, the BIOS or other binary blobs if you have any, unfortunately, any binary driver. I don't. I don't have any binary driver anywhere, not even on my cell phone. But uh, if you have any kind of binary blob in your kernel, IBRS will cover it. And, and with, especially with the downstream implementation, we made sure to use IBRS around BIOS calls or power management calls which actually invoke the BIOS. Uh, Repolin, well, Repolin requires rebuilding the software, so you cannot fix the BIOS with that. We cannot rebuild the BIOS. So let's see what kernel IBRS or kernel Repolin will do in the same scenario we've seen before. So we return creating poison at the guest user land. Once there is a syscall, we jump into the kernel of the, of the guest, and the poison is still there. I mean, we have the poison here simply because the guest kernel is using IBRS or Repolin, it will, will achieve this exactly the same immunity objective. This poison has been localized, is not affecting us anymore, and the kernel is running perfectly safe. Then there is a VM exit to the host kernel, and again, the poison is still there. And then we do a exit to the host user land, the IO counter of KVM returns, and well, the poison is there, but IBRS didn't flush it. IBRS is just a temporary immunity. It's not IBPB, which would actually flush the poison away. And so the guest user can still influence the host user 
So theoretically, <laughs> you could still read the QEMU memory. So I'm showing you why, effectively, we also have another option, which is not the default, again, because by default, uh, downstream and also upstream, because there's no IBRS always upstream, uh, we fix the kernel attack. So by default, we make it impossible to read the kernel memory. And the reason is because the kernel memory is the first uh, line of defense in some ways. I mean, we have to defend the kernel memory as our first priority. Because if you can read the kernel memory, you can read everything. While, uh, and second, there is a much bigger problem. So the kernel is always there. The kernel is always there, ready to be attacked in some way. User land can actually be switched, so there is all kind of jittering, and especially there is no proof of concept of this one, while there is for the kernel. Again, because the kernel is there, it's much easier to attack. Also, it requires a single step. So let's assume we have a malicious, um, uh, let's assume we had the malicious kernel which created the poison. It wasn't created by the gas user. As the next step, the kernel will just be there at a single one distance of privilege level. So protecting the kernel by default is a must. Protecting user land, QEMU, from a gas user attack is a wish. And we provide it as a fixed, and it's fully fixed also, with IBRS always. So if you go in the bugfs of the downstream kernel and you set IBRS enabled too, or IBS enabled 3, which will use Repolin for the kernel and IBS for the user land, of course, because we cannot rebuild all the user land, right? Maybe it's not even uh, open source, some parts. So, uh, this IBS uh, 2 and 3, IBS enabled 2 and 3, will make the whole thing impossible, including the thing I said about this theoretically possibility of attacking QEMO user land from a guest user. And <clears throat> there is also another way we fix uh, uh, downstream very old uh, MD CPUs uh, because these CPUs had uh, a special chicken switch. I think that's, that's how it's called. It. Hopefully I remember correctly. It's an internal, let's say, uh, CPU jargon. Uh, and uh, this MSR has always been available to disable indirect uh, prediction. And so because it was already available, we just activate it. And uh, if you're running one of these CPUs with the downstream kernel, enterprise kernel, you're going to find in the um, slash uh, CPU system devices uh, vulnerabilities, and uh, the Spectre variant one file will show IBP disabled. So this is a special mode only for old CPUs and doesn't require a microcode because it's already there. It doesn't require Apple in, it doesn't require IBRS, and it's uh, fully equivalent to IBRS uh, always because it's disabled in the branch prediction also in user land. It's just enabled at boot. Then you can also effectively do a little trick, which I <laughs> actually run on my laptop, uh, on, uh, which is Ivy Bridge, and so you can manipulate the MSR by hand if it's available. So if you see that IBRS is available in slash proc CPU inf, which means you updated the microcode, and I'm running, of course, an upstream kernel on my laptop. And uh, if you do DD from slash dev slash zero in slash dev slash null, this is just a very large syscall, a single syscall, actually 10 syscall because count is 10. And this is going to read at 7 gigabytes per second, and then you are going to write 1 into the spec control MSR, which is 0x48. This will be IBRS always, because just enable it. And you can notice it actually makes quite a bit, bit of a difference my, on my laptop. And that's why you want to generally use Repolins on these uh, CPUs because Repolin will be extremely faster. In this case, it will be zero overhead because there's no branch, indirect branch whatsoever, in copying 128 megabytes of memory from slash dev slash zero and slash dev slash null. And then you, if you set it back to zero, because maybe you say, well, you know, I just want to test it, like in my case, and then you will get back the performance. By the way, I use Repolin in my laptop, so it's already protected, just 
uh, I tested also IBRS always to show you what you can do. Then we have IBBB. What I covered with IBRS and Rapoline was the first attack. The attack where you have an attack through different privilege level, but within the same thread context. Like I said before, we can also have user land attacking user land in the same level, without actually changing level up and down. So <clears throat> there are two different approaches here. Again, upstream, it's doing this IBPB, which is flashing the poison away. IBPB is the only thing which guarantees you to, po to flash the poison away. Some implementation of IBRS, because they couldn't just make it immune and without flushing the poison away, which, creates, which increases latency, might actually implement IBRS with the barrier, but it's not guaranteed. The barrier is the thing which flushes the poison away. So you cannot depend on it. IBRS is just a temporal immunity. IBPB is the thing which removes the poison from the CPU and flushes the whole branch predictor. Not the LSB. For the LSB, we have a special sequence. So, if the next process is not dumpable, like GPG, for example, GNU-PG, so that's the not dumpable bit, this will trigger an IBPB before we start running a GPG. So in between the content switch, in the MM switch, actually, uh, we, we run the IBPB. Downstream, we are a little more fine-grained, where we actually run IBPB also if we cannot betray the next, the next task. And of course, if you have the not dumpable bit set, you cannot betray a process with not dumpable bits. So in this way, it's full equivalent, but we run it in more places, basically. If you have, generally speaking, if you change the user, so you have two processes with different user ID, they cannot betray each other. When there is an MMS, which we will run IBPB downstream. For KVM, we have a special case because we assume every VM is going to attack any other VM, even though QM can be traced each other. So for KVM, whenever there is a change of VMCS context or SVM context, Intel and AMD, there's always going to be an IBPB. So when we change, in fact, when we switch virtual machine, we always do an IBPB to flush the poison away. So one virtual machine cannot attack the next virtual machine within the same thread context. And this is graphically what I just said, which is, uh, you have two user processes because the kernel is there is only one, one of kernel. Then you can have one kernel for each built machine, but then you can have as many processes as you want practically in, in the host and also as many processes as you want in the guest. And in between these content switches between processes, in between VM switches, like I said, always, and again in between content switches of user processes in the host, we always do this IBPB. So in the kernel case, always in the user host, only for not dumpable or when you cannot be traced. So let's go to the last way of using a Spectre variant 2, which is through hyperthreading. Of course, you can disable hyperthreading, but it's lower. And uh, <clears throat> the other way, again, is to use Rapoline or IBRS, because IBRS is always going to imply what uh, is also called STIBP. And uh, this STIBP only protects for hyperthreading attacks. IBRS protects for hyperthreading attacks and also all the other kind of attacks like privilege level attacks. But uh, IBRS always supersedes STIBP. So we don't yet support STIBP explicitly, we could, in theory, just, for example, in the guest uh, user, STIBP and IBRS are effectively equivalent from a semantical standpoint because there's nothing lower privilege, so it will be enough to set STIBP. But the problem is not all the CPUs are supporting I, uh, STIBP if they are supporting IBRS. So IBRS is, is more a uh, catch-all solution. Uh, <coughs> And of course, IBRS also makes, uh, like I said, the hyperthread immune. So while we, we use Rapoline for the kernel protection, if you want to have hyperthreading protection of the user land, you need to use IBRS always or IBS, IBRS user. So if you don't use IBRS user or IBRS always, setting IBRS enabled two or three in the latest downstream kernels, user land can attack other user land 
using Spectre Variant 2. So in downstream, we fix it 100% with IBRS always and IBRS user. So this is another important thing we did, which is, in fact, this is one is like uh, uh, living in its own, uh, in its own side. Uh, it's not directly connected to Spectre Variant 1 and Spectre Variant 2, but it's still connected to both. Uh, because when you have one of these gadgets, like in the kernel, and you find one of these gadgets, uh, you need uh, an untrusted value in some register to be able to use the gadget. And uh, when, we, when we run a syscall, for example, the syscall, uh, we run another function again, and the ABI of x86 uh, defines something called collisive saved registers. And because uh, the, the coli is going to save the register before clobbering them, before using them, we don't actually initialize them because we know that it's not going to change them. It's not even going to use them because it's going to clobber them because it cannot trust the, their contents. So uh, in Linux, in the syscalls, we effectively left some of the registers up to user land they were still the same as when userland was running, and the kernel is running, and the register is still the same, and we run a function, we run another function. But the problem is, even though these registers are being initialized by the kernel before they are used, it is possible the speculative execution is using them with the userland controlled content. So by clearing the registers, both at the syscall and entry time, and also at the VM exit time, when you exit the virtual machine, because there was the same problem when you exited the virtual machine. Uh, we didn't initialize to zero the registers that were collisive saved by the kernel code anyway, because we didn't expect them to be possibly used by anything, right? But the speculative execution could still try to use them, because then, you know, if they were already the right content, it could keep going. And so, since the registry gene makes everything way more difficult to exploit, I'm not even sure if the proof of concept of Spectre Variant 2 for KVM could possibly run after you do the registry gene at the VM exit. That's something we didn't test, but it's, it's a question. So the last thing is the RSB flash. The RSB flash is uh, uh, the way to make the return call safe. Like I said, the return call is going to pop information from something called a RSB. And if you just do the uh, 32 calls, the RSB is going to be safe. And if you have SMAP, SMAP is a, a way the CPU prevents kernel code to execute user code. Because the RSB has full addressing, 64 bit, there is no way that the user land can train the RSB so that the red instruction can start to execute kernel code. It can only execute user code. But if you have this map, it cannot. And that's why when this map is enabled, we don't have to flash the RSB so frequently. We still have to flash it every time at the VM exit time because it could be the guest kernel with the kernel addresses attacking the host kernel on the kernel addresses. In that case, we need to flash it every time there is VM exit. So there is quite some difference in the way it is used upstream and downstream. So the main difference is upstream relates on the perfect symmetry of call and write instructions at all times. And upstream is flashing the RSB only during the context switch, if no SMAP and no PTI, to avoid the kernel speculative execute on user land. So uh, the, in short, uh, upstream is defending the kernel only. Downstream, we flash every time we enter kernel, unless we have SMAP. If we have SMAP, we flash it at content switch, pretty much the opposite of upstream, but the idea is we protect user against user, not only the kernel. So we, we make it impossible user land to attack user land using the RSB information. That's, that's why it's slightly different. Uh, so we effectively flash at IBPB time if, you have, if we have SMAP. And we also cover firmware or proprietary blobs. Uh, the way the attack works with RSB uh, is uh, with uh, uh, something called RSB underflow. And 
we have some problem with the recent CPU where when there is an underflow, even though we might have flushed completely the LSB, we got rid of all the poison from the LSB, well, we use the direct pull-in because we say, well, we stop using indirect jumps and indirect calls across the kernel because we don't want to ever hit on the poison on the BDB, so we only use RET. But the problem is, on some recent CPU, when there is a RSB underflow, the RET instruction will still pull information from the BDB, and it will still be affected by the poison, making effectively RET pull-in not safe to use on these specific CPUs. Well, what I'm going to show can happen. So let's assume we have two entries on the LSB stack only. In reality, there are 32, but the picture will get a little bit big. So I just use two entries. So you do the first call, second call, third call, and then you do the first thread, which removes one entry from the LSB stack, second thread instruction, which removes another entry, and here we go, here we have an LSB underflow, which is going to pull the poison from the BDB, which can make the rate instruction start speculative execution at an address mandated by the malicious user land or malicious gas kernel or whatever. So that's why downstream we default to kernel IBLS if the rate is pulling information from the BDB and uh, otherwise we go full repolin because repolin is much faster. So <coughs> IBLS however solves the problem and in this case, you will see IBLS kernel on CCPUs with, which cannot be prevented to pull information from the BDB in the red instruction. And in the other CPUs, you see a full wrap pull in. And the microcode, however, something important is you say, well, uh, you're using a pull in. So you think, well, I just enough to rebuild the kernel. No because the microcode update is actually preventing, in some uh, implementation, the CPU to pull the information from the BDB in the red instruction. So to make a pull in really safe, you want to update the microcode anyway. Because if you don't update the microcode, uh, there's no way to enable IBRS, but even where red pull in is safe with the microcode applied, without the microcode applied, red pull in might not be safe. And then there is even another issue, which is you might want to have IBPB, because IBPB is needed even if you use Repolin. Because Repolin solves the problem of the attack on the kernel, but it doesn't solve the flashing of the poison when there is a content switch of two different processes in userland. And without the microcode update, there is no way to get IBPB. So in the downstream kernel, if you apply the microcode update, and you can, you can apply it late, there are four APIs, I think, to update the microcode. And there is uh, uh, the best one, of course, is the one in uh, initLD. You do your Android, you rebuild the initLD, you reboot the machine, and that will do the early microcode apply. Or you can, of course, flash the BIOS. That works great, too. Um, <clears throat> So if you use these two methods, these two methods work upstream, and they will provide you an upstream kernel, IBPB and IBRS, if you're, of course, if your CPU supports it. On the downstream kernel, you can just put the uh, microcode in slash lib firmware uh, Intel U code and put the microcode there and tar the tarball from Intel website and trigger a load in slash sys uh, devices, uh, there is a file reload eventually. You echo one into this file, it will load it at runtime, and it automatically selects the best possible mitigation for your CPU, automatically. So <clears throat> downstream, you can do it without a reboot. And downstream, you also have these uh, controls, which are effectively what allows you to tweak all the mitigations. Let's assume, for example, you have uh, um, one of these recent CPUs which defaults to kernel IBRS, and you say, well, the repolin is already a great mitigation. It's not mathematically safe, but it's very, very, very hard to exploit. Maybe uh, you want a little bit more performance, and you think it's practically already so good you don't need IBRS. Well, you can set uh, a RATP enabled one, echo in this file, the number one, echo one, measure 
in, in the slash uh, sys kernel debug x86 red p enabled and then your kernel will switch to repolin even though it's not default for your CPU because maybe your CPU was one of those which was pulling information from the BDB in, in, in uh, a RSB underflow. So this is uh, all the options we have. And IBBB enabled follows red polyin and IBRS. So whenever you have red polyin or IBRS set, IBPB is also set. If you disable both of them, because of course you will gain a little bit of performance, not really much with red polyin. Uh, disabling red polyin frankly doesn't make too much sense because it's already so fast. Uh, but if you disable them both, then IBPB will also be disabled. And like I said before, you can always go the last mile if you have an eHalem or one CPU which gets a particular bad performance hit from PDI, or maybe your workload gets a particularly bad performance hit with PDI, and you can even disable PDI at runtime. Then we have the boot options. Boot options are on, off, auto for PDI. So there is also no PTI, which is completely equivalent to PDI off. And again, upstream we have slightly different options for Spectre Variant 1, which are on, auto. On, auto are completely equivalent. Since there is off, which means by default no mitigation is being applied. And then we have Repolin, Repolin AMD, Repolin Generic, Repolin AMD, Repolin Generic. We have two different implementations for the Repolin. The uh, AMD version has a specific offense, it's a bit shorter, a little more efficient, but uh, these things are mostly for debugging, so you would use auto off or repolin upstream. On the downstream kernel, there is again auto on off repolin IBRS, IBRS always. And then there is repolin and IBRS user. Uh, repolin com IBRS user is the one which uses the repolin for the kernel and uh, IBRS for the user land. Uh, so now we go to the benchmarks. So I want to say that none of the next benchmarks should be taken at face value because these are just uh, micro benchmarks. So, you know, so there have been many quotes about the benchmarks. Uh, it's 5%, it's 10%, all these numbers. So there are going to be worse numbers here, but because it's a micro benchmark. In a real useful workload, the slowdown will be completely different. So don't quote these numbers at face value, please. <laughs> So let's start with the host kernel intensive workload. So by the way, I run this benchmark with the microcode from the March download from my Intel website. Anybody can reproduce this benchmark. You can even run Sandos and then you can get the same result. So I tried with the three different kind of CPUs in this benchmark, Skylake, Haswell, and Broadwell. And you see the black boxes as the default setting for each one of the CPUs. So Skylake is one of the CPUs which pulls the information from the BDB and says a way to stop it. So it will uh, default to kernel IBRS. And here we have uh, this mode is PTI, IBRS, and IBPB. This model is PTI, red polyin, and IBPB. So effectively, this one is red polyin. This one is uh, uh, IBRS, IBRS kernel. Like I said, by default, we only protect the kernel. And then here we have PTI, and this was the same value as with all the mitigation disabled. Before we applied all the patches, it was actually even a bit faster, so it's disabled. We still got a very small overhead, even if you disable all the mitigation, but it's within the margin of error, so I'm not, I didn't go to the trouble of changing the kernel because I could do the benchmark without rebooting, right? So this is really showing the interesting information anyway, which is different between uh, Spectre and IBRS disabled and IBRS enabled. And as you can see, and this was extremely interesting to see when we were developing the stuff uh, during the embargo, the Broadwell and Haswell have implementation of IBRS which is vastly different than Skylake. Skylake is really, really great because here we are running a kernel intensive workload IBRS is being enabled all the time. So it's just a single syscall. It's uh, reading from slash dev slash zero and slash dev slash null for one gigabyte. Single syscall, which triggers a copy user in the kernel of one gigabyte. 
And you can see the sky lake is zero overhead. Uh, if we switch to a host uh, intensive computation, um, <clears throat> uh, so host user, which in this case is just the uh, XZ compression, again, Repolin and BRS kernel works great because, of course, even enabling, if we enable uh, IBRS in the kernel, user land is still running without. So there's no slowdown whatsoever anymore for the default setting. Of, uh, even for the IBRS setting of Broadland as well. But now the slowdown and the effect of IBRS, we see it on the user land case, which is IBRS always and IBRS user. Then we have uh, another measurement, still micro benchmark, which is uh, uh, for the syscall entry points. This is how the syscall entry point uh, latency changes. And you can see there is already a big increase in the latency of syscall just with PTI. Repolin creates an additional slowdown, but it's really only a few point percent, again, micro benchmark. And if you enable IBRS, because every time we enter and exit kernel, we have to change the value of IBRS, which is really the problem with IBRS, uh, especially on Skylake, because on, on Aswell and Broadwell, the CPU keeps running slower, even though you're not doing anything anymore, which should, which should even invoke indirect jumps, but it's still running slower. Uh, so in the case of uh, the, the Red Pauline and uh, the IBRS, you can see the difference in the IBRS setting, and it still stays in the other two models. And then here we have a kernel build. So as you can see, thankfully, the only CPU where uh, Red Pauline is not 100% safe happens to be the one which has the absolute best implementation of IBRS. And because of that, you can see the default value uh, of uh, uh, this uh, Broadwell and Aswell, and then here Skylake, shows very, very minor performance set. If we use default mitigation, which is kernel IBRS plus IBPB, or Red Pauline plus IBPB, and of course, always PTI enabled. So let's see also a benchmark for the guest. So for the guest, uh, even if you use IBRS user and IBRS always, there's no much slowdown. Because effectively, all, all the computation happens uh, in the guest. So even if the host has all the mitigation enabled at the uh, highest possible level, it's still not going to hurt performance too much. And this is the kernel intensive benchmark. This is, again, the same user intensive benchmark. And the, the benchmark is running in the guest and the measurement and the tweaking of the the bug effects control happens in the host. So I'm, I'm just going fast through the slide just to show there's no override. So if, for example, you have pure hypervisor usage and you want to enable IBRS always or IBRS user, of course, you should enable IBRS always only on CCPUs, which get kernel IBRS enabled by default. And you should use IBRS user on CCPU, which get Repolin kernel enabled by default. So there's no much over it. So you can do that on a pure hypervisor and get full security even for the QEMO user land, the, the thing I showed in many slides ago. Kernel build, probably the most interesting of all this benchmark from more global perspective, also practically zero over it. Actually, in fact, there is measurement error. You can see, by the way, the standard deviation here is uh, within measurement of error. This was actually measured with perf with dummy, uh, dummy controls, so I use dummy performance controls. It's not actually uh, altering the runtime of the benchmark. It's just using perf to do the repetition and calculation of the standard deviation, perf stat. And then I run the same thing on a, a EPIC. So the AMD EPIC CPU, uh, if you use the FAM17 uh, version of the microcode and you apply it, like you should, it provides a BPB. So you couldn't provide IBRS, but it provides a BPB. And uh, it's totally enough, because uh, Repolin has a special AMD efficient sequence, fully safe. So we use Repolin plus IBPB. And I'm going to show here if effectively just the Repolin IBPB against nothing. And uh, because CCPU doesn't need PTI. It's not vulnerable to meltdown. So it's just. <laughs> 
<laughs> one less problem he does. And uh, I'm going also fast through the slide showing practically the only thing measurable is the uh, elephants in the syscall table, because the syscall table is uh, um, going to require a red Boolean sequence because it's an indirect jump. The same is true for Intel. And this was again very minor variation, just most of the very five we actually uh, fixed it uh, with the Repolin because this is the most uh, micro benchmark of them all, the kernel entry point one, the, the slide with the kernel entry point. In fact, when you go to the kernel build, it's completely lost in the noise, of course, like it was also the case for, for Intel, of course. And KVM repeated the same benchmark, same results. So uh, by default, we got everything covered with very, very minimal overhead. For any kernel, in this case, would be downstream 7.4z. So since the latest update with Repolin, we solve it practically uh, the slowdown of the initial IBRS implementation. And so we have uh, also here benchmark showing various more, let's say, realistic benchmarks for real application. So it's here not my previous micro benchmarks. This was done by the Perf team. And uh, you, can sh you can see this was the first version of the fix with the microcode, and this is the one with Rappolin. Of course, this run on the um, CPUs like uh, Broadwell, which is much slower with IBRS than uh, Skylake. So on Skylake, it will be nothing like that. <coughs> so you may have noticed that in this wall issue, there's quite some difference between uh, the upstream and downstream implementation, which uh, effectively we are converging, and we, for example, Repolin happened at upstream before we backported it. And of course, we try to submit everything upstream all the time. And uh, uh, the problem is downstream, we have constraints. And uh, we had uh, to fix everything. And in fact, we did even before uh, it was expected, which uh, uh, we released in production, everything fixed Spectre variant 1, Spectre variant 2 and meltdown on January 3. It was already shipping in production on that day. And it required a huge amount of work through Christmas and vacations. John Snows, <laughs> we were really busy at the time and amazing work for, from the performance team. There's a, there's a very understanding lady in the audience. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> Sorry about that. <laughs> so uh, she's not the only one, by the way. So <clears throat> then we have uh, amazing work also from QA engineering, and everybody had to work around the clock at full capacity to achieve perfect stability and perfect security by the day. And uh, of course, we tried to do cross-company co uh, collaboration. It was also impossible to do Repolin in the first wave because it required GCC, GCC change. You need GCC, unless I'm mistaken, 730 upstream before you can actually use Repolin and build a kernel with Repolin. And just one month of time or so was not enough to rebuild all the kernels and trust the new GCC. If, if you get something wrong in GCC, it's even super difficult to debug. So, I mean, we had to be conservative about that initially. Uh, but uh, the other thing is the upstream focus is obviously on the most optimal long-term solution. So uh, we upstream, we don't take uh, you know short-term things, and then we do the best thing later. We try always to do the best thing, and that's also why there is a little bit of discrepancy between the two implementation initially, but over time things will converge. So here I provide some interesting links, and. Uh, I think that's all. If you have questions, John, thank you. <laughs> thank you very much. So, so if, if you guys have questions, we have microphones here. Uh, please come up and ask any questions that you have. Don't be shy. We'll answer if we're allowed <laughs> to answer them. <laughs> Hello, uh, good evening. Thanks for those amazing presentations. Um, I wonder if you could touch a little on the uh, hectic um, pre-disclosure period and um, maybe some lessons learned or just stories from that time. Do you want to go first? Or? You can. Okay. You well, 
I had the distinct pleasure of uh, uh, kind of being one of the ringleaders that created our mitigation team uh, inside the company. Uh, and I'll share, I'll share two anecdotes there. The first one is I thought it was actually really, all right, this sounds wrong. I thought it was really fun, um, but that's because I like this kind of stuff. Uh, <laughs> But it was really fun to work with folks like uh, Andrea uh, and with uh, Paolo Bonzini and, and many other Red Hatters, Josh, Josh and I could say all the needed, lots of people, you know. Huge amount of people in, in the QA team and Perf team. It, it was amazing. The kind of collaboration and cross collaboration between the teams, great time. That was really good, right? It was great time, but very difficult and huge pressure. So I, I have no other words to describe it. It was mm. different time, let's say. <laughs> Well, one thing we have done is we've, we've um, worked to build relationships with, um, so we had, we had the, these exploits on x86, but we actually ship support for four different architectures, and we have about um, eight different architecture companies that we work with. So we actually had to do this conversation with a lot of different companies. And one thing that I've spent a lot of my time doing over the past few months is bolstering those relationships so now you know not only do i have the contacts we've always we've always had the contacts with the the lead architects at these different companies but now we've taken that to another level in terms of building out a capability so that if this happens again we're better prepared for the next time a lot of lessons to be learned in the industry good Hi, you, uh, Andrea had mentioned that they were going to be making changes to future microprocessors so the operating system can inform the microprocessor whether it's a privileged or unprivileged thing. Can you, do you, we know more about that and how do you account for differences in operating systems which may have more than two privilege levels? Sorry. Yes, uh, I can take this one. So, uh, <clears throat> The future CPUs will know exactly about the four, um, I can go back to the slides maybe. We'll know, we'll know exactly about these four privilege levels. In fact, the specifications, the way I understood, because eventually after you start working on these, you actually understand what they do inside the CPU when you call IBRS. And uh, also what will happen after we will have IBRS all. And the way I understood it, is they wrote specifically the specification of IBRS to force us to put IBPB in way more places than we would be required if it wasn't for the new CPU, which will have a new flag called IBRS all, that when it will be set, we will not have to use IBRS ever again, but it will be as secure as always setting IBRS every time we change privilege. So it's a good question. We will have more privilege level to worry about, and because these things will be recorded, the way I understand it from the spec in the CPU, and of course cannot speak for the CPU vendors, but I read the spec, eh, the release. So I can infer we will have this four level recorded, and I think it will be enough. The only issue possibly could be nested KVM, but I think Paolo will have uh, some great fun. skills to handle that too. So <laughs> I'm confident four levels will work great. And the problem we have right now is the CPU doesn't have any knowledge of that. And that's why every time we make a transition between uh, one of these levels and we go, every time we go to a higher privilege level, we have to write into IBRS. It's worth also adding that these, these privilege levels are architectural to an extent, right? So we, we're not, Intel has rings of, of privilege levels. Um, ARM, as an example, has uh, exception levels, zero through three. Um, and it, it, in, similar to x86, ARM has uh, VMIDs, virtual machine IDs, and ACES, address space IDs, which are a bit like PCI IDs. Uh, and what you do is you say from an architectural point of view, here's my matrix of all the possible privilege or exception levels I have. Here are all the matrices of, of virtual machine IDs or address space IDs, and you basically make sure you fully disambiguate that. So we're not inventing privilege that isn't there, except maybe in the case of nested vert, or maybe there's a couple of corner cases. But generally speaking, we're not adding things that are not there. Instead, what we're doing is we're saying the architecture actually has a lot more context than we're being tracked in branch predictors historically. <laughs>
uh, and that will change going forward. And we've actually had a number of conversations. I spent a lot of time working with microarchitects, so I've had a lot of conversations with companies about how they plan to implement this uh, in, in future microprocessors. And for those who are really interested, I have a proposal for how to solve variant one, Spectre variant one, in future processors that a lot of companies are actually looking at uh, for future chips. So that's kind of been fun to work on too. Uh, in the case of uh, PTI being enabled, say I call uh, MMAP, uh, would it just be when the blocks of that file are loaded into the page cache that I uh, hit the, the uh, performance hit on switching from the shadow PGD to the kernel PGD, or is it every time I access that area of memory? If you map a file, right? So if you do, a, if you if you if you map a file, the the. Uh, the actual memory that's mapped there is accessible to you anyway, right? So you don't take a performance hit uh, performing those memory accesses. Where you take the hit uh, is in any system call or any time you go into the kernel and actually do the state transition. So if you sit there repeatedly calling the kernel, you're going to go through these entry exit trampolines. Uh, but if, you, if, if you're just mapping a file and it's mapped into the virtual address space uh, at the same privilege level as your process, then you're not going to take a, a huge hit. In the mapping case, uh, you will take page faults. So, yeah. but if if you are careful, and you do it at once, and you map it at once, then you can maybe unlock it. Because if you unlock it, you do a syscall. It's going to be mapped, and there's no anymore any entry in the kernel, and then no no entry no overhead. And if you're in you know finance, <laughs> and you're writing uh, high performance code, you 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 probably do unlock it anyway, because frankly, you don't want to take unpredictable page faults. Uh, to begin with, so hopefully you're already, already you're doing that kind of thing. We will answer any question, literally any question, provided we're allowed to. <laughs> Maybe a silly question, but uh, so as far as I understand, the root cause of both Smilldown and Spectre is the existence of uh, read uh, time span, the time time span counter operation in processors. So. I'm wondering if uh, disabling, if yeah, if disabling the separation for ring three processes uh, would solve the problem, because uh, ring three three. Uh, <laughs> I love you. Shouldn't, shouldn't I love you? I love access. you so much. Do we have any give? Do we do we have any giveaways? I want to give this guy. Uh, email us afterwards. We're going to find something. I'm going to repeat that. Right. So uh, root cause. Uh, a lot of these attacks rely on timestamp counter use, right? So you have RDTSC, RDTSCP, lots of variants in x86. The different architectures have high precision timestamp counters you can read, right? So surely if we remove those, we're safe. The problem, they've got two problems. The first one is obviously that unfortunately these architectures provide a timestamp counter instruction that is unprivileged. So you have to provide it. You could sort of fake it up and add a fuzz and say, well, you don't need to be too precise, right? So you could do that. However, unfortunately, as I alluded to earlier, there are other ways that you can count time. So one way you can do it is if you have two threads in a process and they both have a shared memory buffer between them, which is why JavaScript removed the shared memory buffer recently from the JavaScript spec retroactively. Um, what you can do is you can have one thread that sits there and just does uh, cycle counting. Just sits in a loop and counts the number of instructions that have passed. And it can measure time without actually having a timestamp counter. And then it can communicate with another thread and say, oh yeah, this is actually how many, times, how many cycles have executed. So you actually don't need... The timestamp counter makes it a much easier, but it's not required. Um, and as I said, Java actually, JavaScript, they actually changed the JavaScript specification. They said, they just, they, they just added the shared memory buffer. They're like, hey, great, wouldn't it be great if threads could commute? And then they're like, ah, that would be good. But it turns out that's horrible because it's going to break a lot of things. So let's take that away. And no one noticed because no one was using it anyway. So um, that's one of the very few cases where they've gone back in JavaScript, for example, and they've said, we're going to remove something because this is horrible, it can be abused. Anytime you have shared memory, you can create these, these constructs. This is where I love the folks at, in Android very much, but they were wrong, because the, the, the fix in Android was they just reduced the precision. 
on timestamps. And uh, if people are watching the replay, sorry, Android team, that is not how you secure things. And you know that, and I don't know why you said that, but that's a different issue. Uh, it's mitigation, like two things where it's not mathematically accurate, like, I don't know, using Rappolin on a Skylake is not mathematically accurate, kind of definitely makes huge difference, but it's, it's not mathematically accurate. What, what we provide is always 100% fix. So no matter, because one other thing is if upstream you're running desktop and I don't know, something which is not extremely uh, critical, well, we may have also government customers, we may have <laughs> people which need perfect security and we need to provide the best possible solution at all times. Email us. That was a really good question. We're going to get you something. Yep. Yeah. A t-shirt. I don't know what it's going to be, but something. All right. Anyone else got a question? Come on. You're smiling. Come on. Come on. It's kind of crazy. Um, so for Meltdown, you rely on this weird interaction between the memory hierarchy and uh, speculative um, execution, right? So you cannot use registers directly to cause trouble. But what if you had like a processor that has a register Windows? And then you like Spark, for example. Yeah, I guess nobody <laughs> cares about Spark anymore. No, that's not true. Some people care about Spark. Um, there are not. What many if you end up you know, spilling registers anyway? Could you still kind of trigger something? Like oh, that? now that's exciting. Can you can you do it with Spark? So the answer is uh, yes, you can. I'm not caveat. I'm not speaking for Oracle Corporation yeah. here. They should tell you about any vulnerability in shipping processors. But could you do it on Spark? Yes. I mean, Any, using the regist, uh, register windows specifically. I'm assuming there are other ways to trigger it. But. Yeah, so so because what Spark does is basically it, it, it actually has um, architecturally more registers than you can use at a single time. And it has this sliding window that yeah. moves. So you're using a certain set of registers. And the idea is if I want to very efficiently move from one frame of execution to another, I just shift this window and it's 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 magic. However, in the implementation of the processor itself, it still does the reorder buffer and it still has more physical registers okay. underneath. So than, like another layer. Correct. Okay. It's always another layer of the onion. Okay. And so, so not only are they doing register windows that you see, but they're also doing uh, the, the, the out of order execution hacks of, of Thomas Sulo. And by the way, that's why register windows are dead. Okay. No one uses them anymore because we just do it in hardware. I see. Cool. Yeah. Thanks for the question. Any more? Are we, I know we're running out of time, so we'll take a couple more. Yeah, go ahead. Uh, unfortunately, a lot of this went over my head, but there's one question I can ask that I know is kind of confused on with Meltdown. Um, how does a process reach outside of its own virtual memory space to some other processes? Uh, memory space to try and read it. That's something I was confused about. Good question. Do you want to? Do you want to try? Sure. Yeah. So I, I wrote um, a detector, uh, which is very simple. Uh, you just uh, set a variable, it's like uh, unsigned long uh, dash uh, address equal cast zero x f f f f f zero something. So you just send an address which point to the kernel. Mm -hmm. so you can even take kind of a random address in the kernel and try them all. That's what, the, in fact, the uh, kernel other space randomization, their randomization actually does, because the kernel can be moved in different places, still in the kernel space, so you just try them all. You just set a pointer at every page mm -hmm. and keep trying. Let me add a little bit. Time in Marth, because I think the question is is so if you've got two different processes running, how can one read from the other, right? Yeah. And the answer is they can't. Yeah. So the so the reason that this works, the reason that the whole attack works, is that every process. So Andrea's got a, a slide here. Actually, is it the pr previous slide? Sure. Uh, on the yeah, on the previous slide, uh, or maybe yeah. well, no, we we'll use this one, right? So, so what what you traditionally have is you have every application has its bit of memory, yeah. and then it would have this common high part of its memory, so the top and the bottom, so the, the bottom part of memory, the application puts whatever it wants there. 
you can think of the top part of every application traditionally being the same. So uh, some malicious application here isn't actually reading from another mm -hmm. application directly. What it's doing is saying there's this optimization we've always done where we've always mapped all of physical memory in here. So it traditionally, every running pro I know, this is surprising, right? Oh, yeah. Yes. yeah, yeah, yeah. So what's, what's traditionally been the case is that you've had, for every running application, it's had its code here, yeah. and at the top of its virtual address space is all of physical memory. And then we have existing protections in our page tables that say, but you can't access this. However, if the hardware is broken, mm -hmm. you can. So you don't actually read, it's not one application reading another, it's one application tricking the hardware into accessing a physical memory address that happens to be mapped at the top of its address space. And you can do that to dump all the physical memory and by extension every other program. Right. So, so it's a hack, it's, it's attacking, you know, we've always had this assumption that that's secure we can map it at the top. You, yeah, I'll let Andrea. Uh, it walk it that. is on some uh, vendor CPU, in fact. Right. So it's, it's <laughs> <laughs> if you get it, if you, if you screw it up, then, then yeah, this let, happens. Let's yeah. say Spectral Variant One and Variant Two are really subtle things of the architecture, which are very common for practically everything fast. But this one is really kind of more specific to a few vendors, which made things a little different than the others. And the fact here. The kernel space is shared by all the processes. It always stays there, and you can basically take a pointer anywhere in this range mm -hmm. and try to reference it. It should not let you do that. <laughs> yes, you should not get uh, the speculative execution running with that kind of pointer. Or, mm. or actually, the most important thing: you should not have activated the, the L1 cache, right. which is or the TLB, both of them. So, when they say when they say that future processes will be fixed or are not, not vulnerable to this, what they mean is they're changing the implementation of the reorder buffer so that when you perform an access here that you're not allowed to do, as I said in my part, what it will do is it will tag and say, at some point in future, trigger an exception, tell the, tell the program, crash the program, do something, right? Yeah. Um, but in, in, tradition, in, in some designs, it will tag it and keep going and say, oh, I'll, I'll handle it later. And what the, the, the fix is, is very simple. When you tag it, you, you kill the execution there. That's, that's one of the terms that they use. You just, you just kill it. You basically, you say, nope, I'm not going to keep speculating. I'm just going to kill it right here. And I'm going to just, you know, stop. Uh, and, and so if, if you do that, it's actually a very straightforward fix to do in future chips. Unfortunately, you do have to change right. the chip design. Thank you. Are we out of time or? I think we nope. are. You want to keep you want to keep going or yeah. <laughs> I think it's uh, so we'll have to take the rest of the discussion to the to the bar or on the way to the bar. Uh, that again is the Cupping Room Cafe, uh, 359 West Broadway. We do have to close out to give the to to let the uh, two Sigma folks close up the space. Okay. Round of applause for John and Andrea. Thank you. Thank you very much.